and the jazz. <laughs> You'll need uh, your Bibles open, or the booklet open, at uh, the opening verses of Galatians and chapter 3. Don't be so stupid. Has anyone ever said that to you? How would you feel? What if the person was a kind friend, and you knew that they cared for you? What if they were really wise too? Would you stop to listen, or would you just be <coughs> offended? Don't be so stupid. That is pretty much how Galatians chapter 3 begins. We see it in the first verse. Oh, foolish Galatians. We have it again in verse 3. Are you so foolish? These words are taken from the middle of Paul's letter. The uh, Apostle Paul is writing to Christians in various churches in the area of Galatia, what we now call Turkey. Paul had planted those churches and now he was really worried about them. That is why he is so blunt. Don't be so stupid. What was it that had so upset and unsettled the Apostle Paul. And why does it matter to us today? Well, here is the answer. The Galatians had started so well. But now they were veering off course. They needed waking up to their danger. I remember one Sunday evening I was preaching in a church far, far away from my home, and now I was driving back. I'd driven there in the morning, I preached in the morning and in the evening. I'd made conversation in the afternoon with my hosts, and now I was driving back, and I was pretty tired. My head was nodding, my eyes were starting to close. And then suddenly, bang, 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 bang! What had happened? Suddenly, I, I, I've never been so wide awake. What had happened was that I had drifted to one side as I was driving, and my car wing mirror had clipped a metal pole. And, and the, the wing mirror of the car had come off, but it was an electric <laughs> wing mirror, and so it was still hanging on by its wires, and it was going bang, 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 up and down on the side of my car, taking all the paint off. But I was so grateful. I was so grateful because I was in danger of drifting off. And it could have been so much more serious. I don't mind losing a wing mirror and some paint rather than driving into a wall. I was in danger of drifting. And these words in Galatians 3 are like that moment. The Galatians had started well, but now they were in danger of drifting off. And these verses remind us of what it means to start the Christian life and what it's all about. And they also show us the danger of drifting off so we can avoid it. So I've got two points, again, from Galatians chapter 3. The first point is a good start. The second point is a dangerous drift. So let's start with our, our first point, a good start. Sometimes reading uh, the letters of Paul, uh, it's rather like listening to a telephone call. You can hear one person talking, but you have to work out what's being said at the other end. It's often like that when we read the letters in the New Testament. We can work out what's happening at the other end by listening carefully. And so it is in this letter. So we need to figure out what the situation was in Galatia that Paul was addressing. So here is the first thing to figure out, the message that these Galatians heard. The message that they had heard and responded to when they became Christians, what was at the heart of that message? What would you say was at the heart of the Christian faith? 
Is it about believing in God? Is it reading the Bible? Going to church? Is it about trying your best and doing good things? Well, all of those things should be true, but they're not the heart. The heart is there in verse 1. Of foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That is the heart of the Christian faith. Jesus Christ clearly portrayed as crucified. It's a person, Jesus, and it's an event, the crucifixion. And it's clearly portrayed, it's like a giant billboard declaring its message. It's like neon lights lit up. What is the heart of the Christian message? If a person's answer to that question doesn't centre on Jesus and doesn't centre on his death, then that person is probably not yet a Christian in the Bible sense. So why is the Christian faith all about Jesus and his death? Well, we saw the reason in last night's talk. Things are too bad for us to put them right. The human race is at war with God. And any idea about doing good, or loving your neighbour, or trying your best, just doesn't grapple with how bad things are. How bad we are, deep down. What we need is not good advice. What you need is not good advice, but it is good news. What we need is not just a teacher, but a rescuer. And that is what Jesus is. We saw that last night, didn't we? The saviour, the rescuer is Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that Jesus is God's son. We looked at that and we saw why God's son, the one who had, with his father, created the world, the one who has always been, the one who is glorious and knows all things, we saw why he had become one of us. So he could do that one thing that we can do, but God can't. So that he could die. So that he could be crucified. So that he could lay down his life as a ransom for many. Before your eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Jesus died as a substitute. He took the penalty that I deserve. So what was at the heart of the message they heard? It was Jesus Christ crucified. So here's the next thing to work out. How did they respond to the message? How did they respond at first? Well, what word sums it up? It comes three times in our verses. They, they believed. They believed what they heard. We have it at the end of... Verse 2, about hearing with faith. We have it at the end of verse 5 again. Hearing with faith. We have it in verse 6. Abraham believed God. How did they respond? They believed. They believed what they heard. Now if you go into a shop and you want something, what do you do? You pay for it. I hope. <laughs> when you receive a birthday present or a gift, what do you do? Do you pay for it? Of course not. You receive it. Someone else has done the paying. To pay for it would be an insult. Imagine someone gave you a gift and you, you reach into your pockets for your, your money, your wallet. That's not how you respond to a gift. Now look at verse 2. Paul says, let me ask you one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So two things are contrasted. On the one hand there is observing the law and on the other hand is believing the good news. The law says, do. Do this. Do that. The good news says, done. Jesus has done it all. Jesus has paid the price. The law makes demands and calls us to obey. 
The gospel makes promises and calls us to believe. And when it comes to Jesus crucified for sinners, the only appropriate response is faith. You can't try to pay. You can't contribute. That would be an insult to God. It would suggest that you have to add your little bit. It would suggest that what Jesus has done isn't enough. How did they respond? All they had done was to hear the gospel and believe it. Here's the third thing to figure out. What happened to them? What happened to them? Paul describes a number of things. They received God's spirit. <coughs> we read about that in verse 2 and verse 5. God worked miracles in their midst. We read about that in verse 5. And it seems that they suffered hostility and opposition. That may be the point of verse 4. And it's suggested elsewhere in this letter. But I want to focus on one thing above all. What happened to them? God counted them as righteous. God justified them. That's what justify means. It means to count someone as righteous. Like Abraham there in verse 6. <coughs> Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And this is such an important point. Perhaps the greatest reformation, rediscovery of all. Let me describe, I'm going to describe now what the church wrongly believed. I was uh, speaking in my church the other day and I got into some trouble uh, because I was, describing, uh, I was describing something which was a wrong position and a number of people, I, I obviously wasn't clear enough, a number of people thought that this was what I was saying. And so afterwards I had some, uh, some concerned emails and, and so I'm going to make sure what I say now is wrong. Okay? But this is what the church wrongly believed before the Reformation. And this is still what the Roman Catholic Church teaches and other churches too. Before the Reformation, the general idea was that getting right with God was a process. It was a process which dealt with a person's moral state they were inside, good or bad, and it was a process in which both God and the individual person made a contribution. Three things very important. They were wrongly teaching it was a process, it was to do with moral state, and then it was a, a joint thing, God and human beings. Now remember this to the truth, this is what the church falsely taught, and it started with baptism. At baptism, God put a habit of love into the heart of the baby. And there was now some moral goodness in the baby. And then the idea was to nurture that habit of love. It was the process of improving and refining that moral goodness. You did your bit, and God did his bit. You contributed your works, and God put in his grace. And the end of the process was at the gates of heaven. At that point, you hoped that your love for God, that you had been nurturing all through your life, now matched God's love and merited God's forgiveness. And if it did, then God would declare you righteous and would welcome you into heaven. And if you weren't righteous enough when you died, and to be honest, who would be? That wasn't the end of the world. The remaining moral flaws and failures in you could be purged away by you suffering in a place called purgatory. And that would finally make you righteous enough to deserve heaven. It was rather like a business investment. God put in his grace, sort of invested his grace into you, and then you worked hard, hard enough to earn his, uh, 
earn his favour through your goodness. His investment was the sacraments, so that's how it came to you, that's how it was drip fed to you, and then you had to make the best of it. Imagine you were like a, a company, and there's a venture capitalist, and he's, he's putting money into the company, but he's expecting you really to, 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 to make the product, and to sell it, and to, to earn the money, and, and so uh, he keeps putting in some investments, and you keep working hard, and that was the Catholic view, that was the wrong view. Because that is not the great news of the Bible. And that is not the great news of the Gospel. The great news of the Gospel is that being made right is not about our moral state, but about our legal state. It is not what we are, but what God counts us to be in his books, as it were. God declares us to be righteous based on what Jesus has done, despite the fact that we are not righteous at all. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5 is absolutely clear. It talks about God who justifies the wicked. God who declares the wicked to be righteous. And this is not a slow and uncertain process. But we can be right with God in a single moment. The moment we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his death, we can be right with God. You know, this is a wonderful thing. A person can walk into your church service as an enemy of God. They can walk into your church service on the pathway to hell, and they can walk out of that same service, that same day, a child of God, on the way to heaven. Isn't that an astounding thing? Isn't that something that you want to see happening? I mean, who else on this planet has got a message like that? You can come in hellwards, and you can go out heavenwards. You can come in as God's enemy, and you can go out as God's son. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it's not something where God does a bit and we do a bit. God has done everything. Jesus has done everything and we simply receive it. We simply have to trust. Now there is a, a bit by bit process of growing in our love for God. But it's not how we get right with God. That process is what happens when we are right with God. Because we want to please Him. Because we love Him. That is why God gives us His Holy Spirit. So we do grow in love for God. But it never earns us a place in heaven. Jesus has won that for us. Every Christian has a perfect righteousness. And it is what God has given them. Because of what Jesus has done. In a sense it's... Jesus' righteousness counted as ours. That's what the Galatians had. Simply by believing. Faith alone. It was a good start. It was a wonderful start. That's point one. On to the second point from Galatians 3. Why was Paul so upset? Why the tough words? Because they were right in the middle of a dangerous drift. A dangerous drift. We saw how they started, but how are they doing now? What were they doing now? Basically, it came down to this. Their focus had shifted from trusting to doing. At first, they had rightly realised that the, the only response to the amazing love of God the amazing love of Jesus dying for sinners, the only response was trust. Just trusting. That would put you right with God. That way you would receive God's spirit. It was believing, not doing. Now, of course, they wanted to do things to please God. They wanted to obey Him. They loved Him. They were grateful. But they realised that the basis, the foundation, was trusting. Jesus had done it all. Nothing they could do would make them more right with God. Jesus had done it all. That's how they started. But now, 
Now, they were starting to think that keeping the law did get them right with God. And that their human effort did make a difference. It wasn't all Jesus. It wasn't all God's Spirit. They could put something in the pot too. They could contribute. The problem was this. Some men had come and told them that it wasn't enough just to believe in Jesus. There were other things that they needed to add as well. Like being circumcised. That was the thing that marked you out as a Jew. Or keeping certain food laws, things that you could eat and couldn't eat. Or celebrating a, a calendar of, of religious special days. Now it was doing as well as trusting. Paying as well as receiving. And Paul says, no. No, no, no. Keep on just as you started. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by words of the law or by hearing with faith? It was by hearing with faith. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by words of the law or by hearing with faith? It was by hearing with faith faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. How do you get counted as righteous? It is by believing. By relying on God's promise and laying hold of it. Every good thing had come to him simply by believing. So why change course now? Why shift the focus to observing the law? If trusting Jesus is good enough to put you on the road to heaven, then trusting Jesus is good enough to keep you on the road to heaven. If you start leaning on your own effort, you stop relying on Christ's blood. You can't do both. It's like driving. You're either a passenger or you're a driver. Now, I know some people who are passengers speak as though they're drivers, but really, you're either a passenger or a driver. When it comes to getting right with God, Jesus has to drive. You can't grab the wheel. That will be so dangerous. That will be lethal. Imagine you're driving and your passenger, I'll join in too. That is how dangerous what was happening was. You see why Paul was so concerned? The wrong view would take them off the Christian path. Jesus' death would do them no good. They lost forever. No wonder, he says, don't be so stupid. They were throwing it all away. Well, look at verse 3. What does verse 3 say? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? They were trying to attain their goal by human effort rather than by the Spirit. Perhaps their thinking went something like this. Yes, you can get right with God by trusting in Jesus, but what about growing as a Christian? What about living the Christian life? Surely the key thing there is your effort. You trying to obey God's laws. And Paul says, no. The key thing is not your effort, but God's Spirit. Without His help, then no amount of rules will do you any good. Because you won't be able to keep them. You need to rely on God's Son for forgiveness. And you need to rely on God's Spirit for help to live. It's still all about believing. It's still all about receiving. That's how they started and they needed to keep on that track. We need to remember that God has only one answer, and that is Jesus. The death of Jesus to deal with our sins, and the spirit of Jesus to transform our hearts. Now we can see, I, I, I hope we can see already, how this all fits with our theme of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. Because in the years before the Reformation, what was true in the Galatian churches had become true of the church as a whole. They had dangerous 
totally drifted from the truth of faith alone. Yes, there was grace. Yes, there was faith. But in the end, it was whether a person had done well enough with the grace that they'd received. Faith was vital, but it was not enough. The doing was vital, but the Bible says no. It is faith alone. It is simple trust in Jesus as the saviour of sinners. You don't contribute anything. You, all that you put in are the sins that need forgiving. All that you bring is the empty hand. God, you come to God with an empty hand to receive his forgiveness and there and then, on the basis of what Jesus has done, God declares you to be righteous. All in a moment. Not a gradual self-improvement, but a status. Right with God. All in a moment because Jesus has dealt with your sin on the cross. We don't make a contribution of our own. We just rely on God's contribution. Faith is receiving and resting upon Christ crucified. Now faith is more than simply knowing the good news. And faith is more than simply believing that the good news is true. Faith is a glad personal trust. It is entrusting yourself to the Saviour. But that is all. Faith alone. And we still need that rallying cry. We still need that slogan, faith alone. For one thing, the Roman Catholic Church has not changed its basic position. It is still a religion of joint effort, cooperating with God's grace and deserving his blessing, rather than simply receiving it undeserved and empty handed But it's not just Roman Catholicism. It is a deep rooted human instinct to depend on our own contribution and to rely on what we do. It's a very interesting thing when I've been around the houses in my neighbourhood, knocking on people's doors and sharing the gospel with them. It's amazing what happens. You explain the gospel to someone, if they're willing to listen, and so many times I've explained the gospel and then the person has started talking about the good things that they do. They've started telling me about how they give to charity. They've started telling me about uh, how they do anyone a good turn. They're a good neighbour. I don't think they even realise what they're doing, but their response to the gospel is to talk about their goodness. That is human nature. By nature, we don't like the idea of a God-given righteousness. We want to work of our own. But we never can. It simply isn't good enough. We have to receive God's gift as a gift by faith. Faith alone. Now, at this point, I need to add a, 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 a clarification. Remember, as we ex explain these alones, we always need to say what they don't mean. Remember when we looked at scripture alone, we said scripture alone doesn't mean me and my Bible. It doesn't mean whatever I say uh, goes. And it doesn't mean that tradition is bad. Remember that? And then when we looked at Christ alone last night, we had to say that doesn't mean that the church is optional. It doesn't mean Christ alone and I can forget about meeting with God's people. And so also, as we think about faith alone, there's something that we, we need to realise it doesn't mean. Faith alone doesn't mean that doing good is optional. Faith alone doesn't mean that good works, you know, you can choose yes or no. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. This is something that the, the reformers were very quick to stress and underline. Yes, it is faith that saves, but if your faith doesn't lead to doing good things, then it's not faith at all. It's a dead faith. It's not real faith. It's the sort of faith that the devil has. He believes in God. He knows about the gospel. He doesn't do him any good. 
Dead faith. Imagine you, you, you have a, a child, a son or your daughter, you take them to the pet shop, they want to have a pet. Is that what it might be? Uh, a, a puppy, maybe. And you say to the, uh, you say to the shop owner, um, I would like to buy a puppy. And the shop owner says, do you want a live one or a dead one? <laughs> That's not what you... Dead faith is no faith. You don't want that sort of faith that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't live, doesn't live it out. But along with faith, there is always the beginning of this changed life. There is always a new appetite for God and for his word and for the church. There is always a desire to please God. It goes with faith. That is always the case. Because the same God who puts faith into a dead heart always adds these other things too. But still we need to stress, it is the faith. It is the faith alone that joins us to Christ so that we benefit from his saving work. Faith alone. How can you know if a person holds that great principle? How can you know if a person understands that? Maybe you have someone who's started coming along to your church. And they're interested in, in getting involved. Maybe you have a membership in your church and they want to become a member of your church. Or they want to take the Lord's <coughs> Supper. And you want to know, have they really got this? How would you find out? How do you know if you've really got it? Well, one helpful way is to ask this question. Ask yourself this question. Why should God let you into heaven? Why should God let you into heaven? Now, when I ask people this, I, I ask them to imagine that they've, they've died and they've arrived at heaven's gates. And God says, why should I let you into heaven? And then you listen to see what do they start talking about. If the answer includes trying your best, or being good, or being baptised, or being born in a Christian country, or a Christian family, or anything like that, then you're not signed up to faith alone. If your answer is simply about believing in God, then again you're not there. Because faith alone is very specific in its object. Under the tap, jump to the pile. Faith alone in Jesus Christ. Does the person start talking about Jesus? And his death. Now sometimes we are so muddled and some, sometimes I'll, I'll push a little bit to make sure. But if, if they don't come back to Jesus, well in the end it's Jesus. In the end it's, it's God's mercy there at the cross. Then there's some more explaining to do. There's some more waiting to do. There's some more teaching to do. The only way to be right with God is through faith in Jesus Christ and his death. And that, is, and that is urgent. But the greatest challenge for us, for you, from Galatians chapter 3 is this. Are you staying on course? Are your eyes still firmly fixed on Jesus Christ? On Jesus Christ as crucified, as the sin bearer? Or are you slipping into a mindset of doing rather than trusting? Are you tempted to think that your standing with God is now propped up by your own goodness. Are you tempted to rely on your own effort rather than to rely each day on God's Holy Spirit helping you? It becomes a challenge. The longer that we, we, we are Christians, and perhaps if we're serving in the church, well, we, it's very easy to start smuggling in the idea that, that my rightness before God includes something of what I am and what I do rather than... Christ alone. Pride is bewitching. We think that somehow to make ourselves more acceptable to God, or to live the Christian life, we can put something in the pot. But we can't. It's all about Jesus to get right with God. And it's all about God's spirit to live well for God. And our first job <coughs> is believing. It is receiving. But faith alone is a very humbling thing. We're going to see that next time, this evening, when we think about grace alone. There's no room for boasting. But above all, faith alone is so reassuring. 
My standing with God doesn't depend on my contribution. It doesn't depend on the ups and downs of my goodness, or my commitment, or my effort. No. My status before God depends entirely on what Jesus has done. Something perfect. Something complete. Christ has offered himself in the place of sins. And God has declared himself completely satisfied. The resurrection tells us that. That was, that was how Jesus was justified. In the sense that Jesus was declared righteous. He always was righteous. But he didn't look righteous when he was dying on the cross. That's not, that's not what should happen to righteous people. When God raised him from the dead, God said, he is righteous. He always was righteous. He is my son. And when God made that declaration about Jesus Christ, he made that declaration about you. If your faith is in him. How wonderful. Simply by trusting him. Only by trusting him. By only trusting him without anything else added, I can be right with God. I can be sure of heaven. I can be adopted into God's family. What good news. Today, you are as righteous as Jesus is in God's eyes. How righteous are you on a good day? You know, we all have good days, don't we? We have good days where we wake up and we want to read the Bible. We read the Bible and it really comes alive to us and then we pray and our hearts are moved in prayer. And then off we go out our job and perhaps we'll meet someone during the day and we'll have the chance to talk to them about Jesus. And we'll work hard, we'll have a good day, we'll come in and perhaps it's all chaotic in the home but we'll react with patience and kindness. We'll put our head on the pillow. How righteous are we that day? We're as righteous as Jesus is. Ah, what happens the next day? You know what happens the next day, because perhaps these days come more often. You wake up and you just don't fancy reading the Bible at all. Or maybe you don't, or maybe you do, but it just th you think, what am I doing? I just don't get this. And then you, you go downstairs and there's a sharp word with your wife or your husband and, or with the kids. And they're, they're, they're just not ready for school. And you think, why can't you get it together? And you go out in, in, in a bad mood, like a, a cloud is following you around the day. And then someone in, in the office or in the playground or in, in the street asks you something or says something and you just completely miss it. You, don't, you have this, this awful day, come back in, you're grumpy, miserable, and you put your head on the pillow. How righteous are you that day? You are as righteous as Jesus Christ. Isn't that tremendous? Isn't that such a relief? What good news. Real faith is never alone. Real faith always leads to love and good works. But love and good works are not our contribution to our salvation. And so their imperfection doesn't jeopardize our salvation. You are safe. Because Christ has won your salvation for you. What we did not win, we cannot lose. We live in a world where vows are broken. We live in a world where commitments are fickle. And everything changes. But we can be safe and secure in this. Christ has died for sinners. Christ has died for sinners who put their faith in him. Only that.